Bonjour à tous, welcome to Carmen Frances TV. I'm so, so glad to welcome Kirstin from Fluent Language today. Um, bonjour, Kirstin. Bonjour, Géraldine. Kirstin is, as I said, the owner and runner of Fluent Language. It's The website, I think, is fluentlanguage.co.uk for people who love learning languages. So today we're not going to talk only about French, but we're going to talk about fantastic methods for learning a language applied to French. Um, Kirstin is a native German speaker. She studied eight languages. That's crazy. And uh, you help students develop a healthy language habit. So welcome, Kirstin. Can you please tell, a, tell us a bit more about yourself if you want? Uh, sure, sure. Um, I am, like many, like most people who are watching Comédie Française, I am also a French learner and I have been a French learner for 22 years. <laughs> so, and I'm still not fluent. Uh, but I, yeah, I just love learning languages in general. So like Geraldine said, I am originally from Germany. Mm -hmm. I grew up um, until the age of 10. Mm -hmm. I never spoke a different foreign language at all. Okay. And something people notice about me now is that my English is very native-like and the German accent isn't quite as um, pronounced mm -hmm. as you would normally hear it. So I guess I've got an ear for languages and I've always really loved them. So I study, my, my main language that I focus on at the moment is the Welsh language. And I've also studied Spanish, Latin, Italian, Russian, um, yeah, French, English. And I'm sort of dabbling in Chinese, sort of starting. And I take great joy from that. That's very impressive. And now you run a fluent language, which is, which is also a podcast, isn't it? Yes, the podcast is called The Fluent Show. Uh, it's all about loving language, living language and learning language. And we, I discuss and bring people answers to language learning dilemmas, tips and questions and even insights into language learning research. So my biggest joy is to inspire and help language learners. And Fluent Language is designed to make life easier, especially when you're learning a language as an adult. That's fantastic. And that's why I was so happy to have you on Comme une Française, because today you're going to share all your tips about setting goals, about how to learn properly, which is not something I do because that's not my area of expertise, but you mm -hmm. are. So I wanted to uh, get you on Comme une Française for, so you could share this tip with our audience watching today. Yes. Yeah. Teaching yourself a language is very different from learning a language in school. And there's a few tricks that makes it easier. That make it easier. <laughs> so the first one is about setting goals. It's something you mention a lot. And uh, from what I've heard from my students, they always say, yes, I want to learn French, which is absolutely vague and is, can be very disappointing because mm -hmm. their goal might not be what they can actually achieve. So I always ask my students, why do you want to learn French? So we can kind of visualize together what matters, what doesn't matter, and what they can do. Um, But you go beyond that in terms of um, of practicity, I would say. You talk about something more specific, which is really setting goals. So could you mm -hmm. tell us more about, I've, I've read your, your site, and uh, I know you talk about vision goals, you talk about learning goals, and different areas which, which we're going to cover afterwards. Can you tell us more about these goals? That's right. I, I do. I talk about goals as two different types and this really emerged from it like like you a continuous experience of teaching languages and coaching people and mentoring language learners who come with the intention the ambition to learn the language to yeah. achieve fluency often and when you look at those in detail you realize They're basically a moving target. Mm. So it's it's a bit like trying to get hold of a, a very slippery thing. Every mm. time you reach for it and you think, I've got it, it's gone. It's gone. And this is a common experience. So yeah. don't feel bad if this is happening to you because that happens to all of us all the time. And the way to perhaps begin to make things a little bit more tangible is to 
think of goals in two different ways. What you described there, the visualization is so powerful and so strong. And this goes into your internal individual motivation as a language learner. So every person is different. Everyone learns a language for a different reason. Necessarily going from that, it it's so beneficial for you to sit down and think, why am I here? Why am I doing this? Mm. And for some people, it might be that you've just moved to France. For some people, it might be that you are absolutely in love with a particular place in France. Mm -hmm. I know Paris, for example, inspires a lot of love in many people. For other people, it might be French wine. And mm. you might even want to start a business where you are regularly dealing with the French And in my experience, I have had jobs where I got paid extra because I was the French speaker in the company. Not, not, not just once, three times. So there are many, many different motivations. And whatever you dream of is what's going to keep you going. And I often say to people, the main failure in language learning, the biggest thing to beware of is to stop. Hmm. You, you don't stop. The idea is to build a habit so that it just becomes a part of who you are. And before you know it, you'll get there. And it removes this pressure of, am I there yet? Mm. Am, I, am I fluent yet? So that's the first part is this clarity. And it's called a vision goal. And then I talk about language goals. Mm. And language goals are much more based on where you are at right now. What's coming up in your life? Are you, are you going to be busy the next few months? Are you traveling? Have you, have you just bought a new textbook that you're excited about or a, a new book? Is there a series that you're following and so on and so forth? And it influences what you can do in the next few months. So I call those the learning goals or, or path goals, obviously, because they come along with you on the path. Hmm. And they, they, they are your path that you walk. So you see your destination, but you've got to lay the bricks for walking along the path. Hmm. And that is what I do when I teach people how to set their path goals um, so that there's practical things that you can go that you can actually achieve. And it feels great because with fluency, you never know you're there. But when you've actually achieved a goal, it feels really good. And then you want to do more. Can you give us examples of uh, learning goals? Yes, I always split mine into. So in the I work with something called the Language Habit Toolkit. Yes which learners can use. Um, it's, it's available on my website mm. for, for learners, and it's um, very carefully designed worksheets that mm. don't add anything, don't take anything away, and guide you through the process. And then I've written a book that goes with it to you know, really help you understand. And the way this worksheet is designed is basically you look at what you've been doing mm -hmm. so that you can celebrate where you've come from. You look at what's coming up and where you want to get to in the next month, approximately. And then you think about your four core skills, which are listening, reading, speaking and writing. Mm. And ideally, you want to have something measurable, realistic that you can do mm. in all of those. So, for example, in the last I'm like I said, as a Welsh learner in the last month, mm -hmm. my goal was to to start this okay. book called Scoop. That's, that was my reading goal. Mm. And it, it wasn't read the book it, because I was thinking I'm going to be really busy. I've got a lot of work on at the moment. Mm. It was read chapter one, two, three. Mm. Turns out this is written um, in a way that I find very easy to understand and I'm enjoying it. So I've just finished chapter and the chapters are a lot shorter than <laughs> I thought. So I've just finished chapter 23. <laughs> and I can feel good, though, and I'm learning, and it, this gives me something very tangible to look forward to. So that would be a reading goal. For a speaking goal, you can say, book three sessions with my tutor mm. and meet them, you know, just meet and talk. Or it could be record myself if you don't want to work with a tutor. Mm. So you, I'm hoping that the way these worksheets are designed, or I know really that the way that they're designed, it gives you enough structure to get it right, but also enough freedom to be creative and go with what you enjoy. Yeah, I highly, I highly appreciate 
your approach because, well, it's kind of a common sense in terms of organization. You're not inventing new things from scratch, Mm -hmm. but you're applying it to language learning, which is very, Mm -hmm. very different. And from my experience as a teacher, especially online, it's very hard for me to tell my students, all of them, do this, do this, do that, because it has to apply to their level. So it has to be their personal journey. I will be very, very happy to help them on a personal basis if they have questions. But I cannot myself structure their learning because everybody comes from a different background with a different everyday life. So having, as you said, clear goals, which are goals that you can achieve, they're not like it's not learn 100 uh, vocabulary words. It's book a session with my tutor that you can do any time and then... Mm -hmm you're going to learn because you're going through there. So that's very interesting. What would you recommend for people who want to keep up with these goals? I know you talk about something called review. Can you tell us more about that? Yes. When I originally designed the Language Hubber Toolkit, you know, the review process wasn't even in there. I didn't think, I just didn't think about it. Mm. And often when we approach reviewing, sitting down and looking at what did I do this last month, we feel the pressure. We feel, did I perform? Mm. So I want, I was kind of shying away from that. Mm. But I, I um, tested this, I developed this together with a test group of mm. real language learners. And we very quickly realized there was something missing. Mm. So I started looking into the review and what I want people to achieve. And mm. from my long experience in tutoring, I knew that positive reinforcement is an absolute key to keeping going. So realizing what you're actually doing right Hmm. is really important. But also realizing what you're not achieving is really good because then you go, oh, why am I not getting there? So I have a very practical example of a review process for you. Yes. Um, So I check daily check-ins. So every month I look back over my whole month Mm -hmm. um, and I see if my check-ins were about right Mm -hmm. and almost every time I feel so much better afterwards Mm. because I realize I did so much more Mm. I had so much more contact with my target language but over the month of May one of my goals that I set myself was to I like I like to write poetry Mm -hmm. very bad poetry in my target language (laughs) as I find it really fun Um, And it's a great way of playing with words and, you know, looking up new things in the dictionary helps you remember them. So I I set myself the goal of writing a longer poem, maybe with longer sentences. And then on the radio, at some point last month, I heard a wonderful documentary about the King Ganeth, which is a specific type of Welsh poem. Okay. And it, I think it scared me because they were talking about it, like how special this poetry is and how wonderful and what an art form. So I think I thought, no, I'm not, I'm, I just didn't know how to even start. Mm-hmm. So I didn't do anything. That goal just didn't achieve. But instead of, you know, I could just ignore that or forever. What, what we often do is just forever keep pushing that goal mm. and go, oh, I really need to get, I really need to do that instead of stopping going, well, Let's identify the problem. Mm. It's Kanganeth is a bit too ambitious for me right now. And then once you know what the problem is, you can think about a solution. Mm. So for next month, I'm just going to try three haikus. And even if I do one, that's more it's than one. I did in May. <laughs> so it's, it's it can be a very simple thing. Mm. And when you really think, okay, I was just overshooting mm. and admit that to yourself. It teaches you so much that you can take into the future. It makes you more confident and more resilient because the review process, I think it cannot fail but motivate us when we really look and go, what was the problem? Oh, I was, you know, like I thought I would watch TV, but my television is down in the lounge and all my Welsh books are here or my French books. I thought I would talk to the man in the market, but... He keeps talking so fast, I don't even know what he says. So maybe that's not the right person. Maybe I will try the library. Or, you know, something very simple. Mm. It shows you where you are. And we often do this in language learning, where you are seeing the destination, mm. but you forget that the road to get there is not like that. The road is very windy. I'm enjoying 
being on camera for a change because in a podcast nobody could see this. Absolutely. And you're enjoying um, not only your accomplishment, but also language learning is fun and it should be a joy and a hobby. So look at what you've done, even if it's a small thing. It's a small thing. It's that really great. And enjoy all the way. If you watched a movie and just read the subtitles in the end because you couldn't understand, at least you watched it and you're happy. Yes, yeah. And you are building. You are building, building, building. So trust the process. That's a huge, I think, the, at the heart of the language habit mm. toolkit. It's called a habit toolkit because I want my learners to trust themselves and trust the process. Yeah, trust Trust into the teacher and, or the coach is very important. Mm -hmm. I, I often have to tell my students, I know, I've done that many, many, many times. You can trust me, it's going to work. Um, mm -hmm. However, we talked about, uh, you were talking about watching TV, I was talking about movies. Mm -hmm. You and I know the importance of focus when you really want to achieve a learning goal. Because if you just mm -hmm. think, I'm going to put in study hours, I'm going to study three hours every day. First, you're never going to do it. Second, it's not necessarily organized, so you won't learn as much as you could in just 30 minutes. What do you recommend to do instead? <laughs> I like that you say you're never going to do it. Because no, because I, honestly... It's very rare won't. that we find three hours in every single day. Very rare. doesn't happen to me. So what do you recommend in terms of optimizing your time to actually learn something? Mm, there is... Um, I think it's best practice to really make your goal quite small. Mm -hmm. I like to work with goals that I can overshoot rather than fail to reach. I like to work with goals. I, I really have to discipline myself as well to set goals that are very practical, that really have something to do with this. But also I like to consider the long-term compound effect mm -hmm. of contact with my target language so there is focused study and focused study it's tricky because we have this image of study that is textbook sit down etc yeah. and that is partly true however what's also true is that the brain learns when you're having fun and the more you just train yourself to figure things out because mm -hmm. that's fun the more you're going to learn. So this whole idea of study as sitting down with a textbook doing exercises mm -hmm. is in the case of the independent adult learner that, that you are, mm -hmm. if you're watching this probably, is almost, I want to say the German word, überholt. What like is it? It's, it's been overtaken. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, I guess it's, it's perhaps not outdated, but it's going. I mm. think it's going away. The, the most of the polyglot people that I know, they want to apply their learning as soon as possible. Mm. So that would be a tip that I would give to people. Don't think that study must mean sitting down and working in the abstract. But also apply, apply, apply. Make an awful lot of mistakes. Yes. Do book those tutor sessions. <laughs> They've seen it all before. Trust me, I've tutored for five years in German. I've really seen it all before, and I've never seen a single bad student. Well, student, I've never seen a single bad learner. Every single person mm. has been great. So this is just this is just the nature of the beast. You are trying to do... Uh, what you don't want to do is the equivalent of training for a marathon by sitting at home on the internet reading six articles about running, because that doesn't work. You need to get out and do a bit and you are faster than everyone on the couch even if you are very slow mm. so unfortunately we have to take some level of like joy have to we have to work so hard on this taking some kind of level of pleasure and joy in being really bad at this <laughs> to a certain extent um that would be my that would be kind of my tip with study um, or if you really want to do it, or if you just, you know, your teacher goes, you've got to read this grammar mm. rule, you've got to read this article. Um, I like to, I like the idea of reframing, which is sort of from mm. psycho psychology, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's, can you 
think of it not as a burden but as a benefit so I've got this I've got a grammar book and when I do very repetitive quite boring grammar exercises it's very rare because I don't think they teach me that much but when I do them I do them because I find it really calming mm. like it's so boring it's almost meditative mm. and that's quite nice so if you can find something like that if you enjoy traditional study that's cool you know do what's the most important thing mm. and uh What do you think of what I usually tell my students is that there's some point, at some point you're enjoying the language and at some point you're actually learning. For example, I've, as you probably heard many, many times, the thing, yeah, I've learned, I learned English. Uh, I'm, I'm watching Game of Thrones in English mm -hmm. with English subtitles, so I'm learning English. And I usually tell my students who watch Amélie, for example, in French, this mm -hmm. is not learning the language. This is another thing. It's enjoying the language. Mm -hmm. hearing something but you're not going to actively learn that if you want to actively learn with a movie there are techniques for that but don't think that you're learning because you're watching a movie you're enjoying the language that's a very good thing I love the fact that you're doing it but again if you want to learn you have to focus and this needs having this mindset of learning and when when my students start to understand the difference they stop thinking that they're learning because they're watching a movie in French. And they take some, take some time to learn and say, take some time to enjoy the language, but they can make the difference. What do you think about that? Mm. When you're watching a movie, even, okay, watching it in French with French subtitles, if you still understand what's happening... So you're not watching Amelie for the 20th time and you've already watched it in English. So you can kind of make it, you know, imagine what's happening. If you genuinely want to understand what's happening, mm. then your brain will get into that processing mode that is learning. Mm. You're only going to train, though, your input skills. You know, so you, mm. you, you are going to improve at processing what comes in And that's good. And you're going to be better at this if there's already some structure there mm. that that gives you a chance to go, what did she say then? Oh, she said, she said, um, uh, je, je regrette ne pas. What, what is she regretting? What, what, what? You know, so mm. if you know she said what she's saying at the start, then it's easier to figure out what's missing. And it becomes this sort of fill in the gaps, mm. fill in the gaps exercise. And there's even, you know, apps and exercises often center around filling the gaps mm. because because that's what a lot of language is. Yes. So you're not entirely like going entirely the wrong way. It's better than watching a movie in, in English. Oh, yes, you know? absolutely. But but you must remember this whole sense of the core skills. So you've got to then produce So that and, and what I find with learners is that the people make two mistakes or two to me, people make two significant mistakes with input. Number one is they, f they look for things that are too difficult. Mm. And if it's too hard and those gaps are too big, you just switch off. And having just like the radio on all day long in French and don't, not understanding a word, that's it's not going to teach you French because you're just not there. You need to understand what's happening. And the other mistake people make is to focus on one particular aspect of either production or or, or um, processing input uh, without without paying too much attention to the other. They don't all have to be at the same level all the time, but you want to be kind of aiming for that. So that is that is probably where I. Where, where I would come in with that. So you're not doing anything specific wrong, but often if you can't go and buy fish from the market, then what are you doing watching the news? <laughs> you, you are going to feel frustrated. I think that's the big problem. It, it makes you feel frustrated then as a result because you can't speak the way you can understand. Mm. Um, and then frustration is, it just kills. It just kills you in language learning. <laughs> I love your example. If you can't buy fish at the market, why are you watching the news? 
That's what I'm going to tell my students from now on. <laughs> <laughs> Because I see so many have a fantastic written French, but mm -hmm. they're, they don't dare to speak or their spoken French is really bad, as in not bad as a, a judgment, bad as in they don't feel good enough about themselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's, that's, yeah, that's very bad. Um, as you know, in French, we have vocabulary and we have genders. Do you have, mm -hmm. you have those in German, don't you? Oh, yes. Got plenty of genders. <laughs> we have so, more than French. Yes, you have three? Yes. Ah. Yeah, so can you share with us some specific techniques for learning the different areas of language? We can talk about vocabulary, but if you have others, mm -hmm. especially for French, I would love to hear about them. French, to me is a language where learning the rules of pronunciation helped me a lot mm -hmm. and and becoming aware of things like a liaison mm -hmm. so um, if you say um, je vous aime um, je vous aime or aux études mm -hmm. or something like that mm -hmm. so the the word doesn't actually start with z it's mm -hmm. the previous word that ends with the yes and french you know <laughs> runs everything together and this is a classic case that, that of what i often tell people who ask me about how do i learn grammar how do i learn you know xyz um vocab is a bit different but certainly grammar pronunciation um anything that is quite rules led rules mm. dominated I often say, lead with a question, find mm. the question, wait, you know, just consume language, take mm. as much in as you can at, at your level. So something very simple. And when you find yourself going, that must be this, mm. or I wonder why, why do they keep like, where does this Z sound come from? You know, or, or why is, you know, like, why is this la blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And in French, obviously, there are there are certain rules mm. that help you determine if something is masculine or feminine. <laughs> I'm reminded of my French teacher who always said, everything bad is masculine. <laughs> I think she meant le divorce, mostly. <laughs> <laughs> Because in German, that's die Scheidung. Uh -huh. So it's feminine. And the way she told us to remember it was saying that divorce is a bad thing, so it must be masculine. Anyway... <laughs> But, you know, like a word that ends in sion, mm. T-I-O-N, is always feminine. A word that ends in mon, M-E-N-T, is always masculine. So there's certain rules. Mm. But I find to start with those rules is... It's too much because you don't have enough vocabulary yet. Yeah, it's boring too, <laughs> you know. And yes, you're right. Then you're, you're learning vocabulary at the same time. So you're giving yourself a big job. Whereas to ha already have something that exists and go, okay, oh, I understood. This said like temperament, temperament, mm. or rigu. You know, I don't know. Some, some. I'm running out of French words now. But if you've got those words there, and then you learn the rule, then it's so much easier to go. Oh, mm. yes, I've seen lots of words like that. And then you start looking for the proof. And in your brain, this is a great way of mm, activating can... memory because you you actually proved it to yourself that this is happening and you start seeing patterns. And that in language learning, that's such a – when you start seeing the patterns, mm. you know you're doing something right. That's, that's extremely useful. So with these kind of things or, you know, like – instead of starting with, here is the passé composé, no, 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 no. Um, start with, oh, I want to talk about my week or, or like, or I'm reading a text about, you know, a story about someone's week or my friend is telling me mm. this week I did this. What is she doing? How do I reply? Mm. That's entirely different because, again, we're going straight into application and it's better... I, in my experience, it's better to go as practical as you can very quickly at the right level for you. Mm. That's the secret. That's to, a good thing. So perhaps. when the students are learning, they come from, they see something 
that they identify the pattern and then mm -hmm. the, the advice is to ask yourself, I think that's the rule. Am I right? Mm -hmm. They can then explore. And uh, can we come back to vocabulary? So what would you recommend for learning vocabulary? Do you have techniques? It's something that you mentioned on your blog as well. It's every learner is a little bit individual. Uh -huh. So I, I wrote, I did a book about, I wrote a book, a small guidebook about vocabulary and it's actually called a cookbook, <laughs> a vocab cookbook, because you can pick your recipe, try it, and then maybe you will find the recipe you, you love, mm. but you don't have to do everything. So some learners really like to work with uh, very technological solutions and mm. there's amazing ones out there flashcard systems others okay. like to work with a vocabulary list that is handwritten mm. and that's very beneficial i like to i actually switch around i've noticed at mm. the beginning i label a lot of stuff okay. in my house that's a like an absolute classic i have done stickers? this sorry with stickers post-its post-its mm -hmm. in how did you do that what you put them in the language you're yes, looking I've, for I put them in the target language. So as I was, um, I remember my last house, I had stickers. I actually bought uh, a booklet, a textbook, and it came with stickers. It was amazing. Was so good. Wow. And yeah, they were all pre-printed. And it's great because I was learning Russian. Okay. So I, I got, they were all only in Cyrillic, uh -huh. but then also with the pronunciation. Uh -huh. And even, I think when we moved out, there were still some, some stickers <laughs> in the house. <laughs> So it might say like banya in front of the bathroom. It might mm. say spalnia for, I think that's bedroom. Mm -hmm. I saying, I think now. Um, and then it says like at the window, it talked about the window and it said, I remember exactly. I put one on the oven on like, mm -hmm. you know, the splashback behind your cooker. Yes. It said plita. And that's, that's that. And then I put the one for plate in the, in the plate, literally in the cupboard. So I see it all the time. Mm. Everyone who has ever lived with me has has noticed this. <laughs> I like to put vocabulary on the mirror as well uh -huh. when I want to really m remember it regularly. Mm. And then what I do now is I just use the fridge magnet and put it, things on the fridge. Mm. And I make my own list because then I can do it in Welsh to help me. And I can do it in German to help my husband <laughs> at the same time. And when I have run out of, or when I know that this is, you know, bicycle is like mm. bicyclette yes. or something like that, or, or vélo, then I can go, what color is my bicycle? Mm. Vélo bleu. And then I can do a sentence, perhaps. Je sors avec mon vélo bleu, or mm. something like that. So I can just build it up, build it up, build it up. And I will see it on a regular basis. And that, at the heart of every single vocabulary technique that I have seen, is the idea of, You learn some. It's it's memory. Yes. You learn something once. If you never look at it again, it's going to go like that. If you look at it straight away, you just you know like you could stare at it for two hours. Mm. Doesn't matter because tomorrow is another day, and mm. then. So you need to what you need to do what's called spaced repetition. Mm. So you learn you look at it once. You don't even need to like memorize it in a crazy way, although it's helpful. Um, and again, it checked out, check the book because I don't have time for, you know, to look at some techniques. Um, and then you just leave it and then it comes back maybe in three days mm. and then maybe it comes back later. So, because I don't stand at the oven all the time to see this word, but when I come back, it's there again. And then I go away and then I come back and then I go away and my husband cooks <laughs> And then I have a day off mm. and then I cut back. And this way, you don't have this happening. Mm. You have something that goes like this. And that's how you get it into your long-term memory. This is something that Duolingo does in their app. They, they yes. come back with the lessons again and again and again. And so that's a good thing. Uh, oh, we're yes. going to put the links to uh, the post we're talking about on below the video on comingfrances.com. So for people watching, there are lots and lots of resources out there because uh, Kirsten has done so much work about these uh, topics. Too many, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is never too many because when it, when you're even when you repeat something as a technique, maybe mm -hmm. a year ago the the student reads the blog post but doesn't memorize it or is not ready for it. So mm -hmm. if you talk about it again, we're like. 
Ah, uh, yeah, that's good for me now. Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. Okay. I've got five years of writing on the website, so there's a lot to get into. <laughs> yeah. Good that we sorted through it a little bit. Um, I would love to talk now a bit about your personal experience in language learning. You've learned, you've learned eight languages so far. How do you think you will approach the ninth one? Hmm. Well, the ninth one, I'm sort of playing with it at the moment, I guess. But I'm not committing. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm playing with Chinese. Something I will do that I didn't do in school. Mm -hmm. And I learned my first five languages in different ways in school. Mm -hmm. Something that I will do for every language, I think, in the future is to look for... Um, stories and input very early on and get more input mm. uh, so that, that so that it can be interesting mm. something that works really well is to have little soap operas I really like yes. little video series yes and then just with some lessons that are based on the project I love those I love those and then that's I sort of have my vocabulary learning technique down but honestly I'm not, how we say in English, wedded to it. Like mm -hmm. I'm not married. Yes. <laughs> um, because I, the, the good thing about being so many languages in is that you trust this process. Mm. So you know it's a lot of work. It never gets easier. But I don't think about, is this possible? Yes. I always, I know it's possible. Because you trust the system. Yes, yes. And I, I trust myself and every learner, if I could give them one thing in my work with them together, and I and that's how I, you know, in, in one to one coaching, particularly, it's so effective. So to give somebody this understanding, this, this feeling to give them, maybe sometimes you can give it to them only for another two weeks, and then they come back and because something was difficult. Mm -hmm. And then you, you do it again. But a lot of it is just, I want to give you the knowledge that you can do this. Because you can. Yes, I, I agree. 110%. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about the eight future nine languages that you're learning. Can you share a bit about, more specifically, what were your struggles with French and how you overcame them? <sighs> Who says I've overcome them? <laughs> I learned French in school. I think I had several struggles that a lot of people will connect to. Mm. Struggle number one, my French teacher wasn't very inspiring. Oh. Yeah, I'm sorry, Madame Perrault. <laughs> Madame Perrault just... was teaching me math. Ah! Oh! <laughs> so maybe she, maybe she was, she was busy. doing both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly so she was she was very busy she had like a night job or something <laughs> in France and Germany <laughs> yes and I think I suffered from this um French not being in the culture in the popular culture mm -hmm. as much as English mm -hmm. so again I also didn't really bother I only took French because the choice was French or Latin mm. and Latin's dead <laughs> That's when I was 13 years old. I didn't realize the benefits of learning Latin. Um, so that was kind of my, my first really was to just kind of scrape along mm. in school. Mm -hmm. There are certain grammatical aspects that I found really difficult. Mm -hmm. Not the passé composé because it's logical. Even when it's adding E's and S's and stuff, it still mm. makes sense. It made sense to me why it's happening. So it was easy. Whereas... The sub subjunctif yes. makes no sense. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> or, or so I, you know, this, the subjunctif, it's not quite as easy to think this is logical. Mm. So that was a struggle. So grammatical things for me also, it's difficult, but not impossible to, to get them right. I think the biggest issue is that my French was, because it was so classroom based, And we had a school exchange, but we never really took it out of the classroom enough. Mm. And I didn't have what I had with English, which is all this pop culture, all this motivation. Mm. 
so the biggest problem for me was what you described as well. Like even in university, I, I never stopped with French. That's the reason I'm good at French is because I'm stubborn. Never stop the habit. I'm just going to keep doing it. But I never spoke mm. very much. So I came out being a, um, I can write extremely well and, you know, on the grand scheme of things, I can write very well in French. Um, I can understand French, mm. but my written was prioritized over my spoken French. And, and my reading was prioritized over my listening. So even though I am a trained trilingual secretary, um, and I'm very good at taking dictation, mm. <laughs> I, I can't understand street French mm. as easily. So the only way to remedy that for me um, was to, to spend more time in France, which is easy when you are living in Britain or living in Germany where I lived, mm. or failing that um, to find more people in French. But I am still, I still don't have the spoken confidence that I would like mm. to have in French because I think with French in particular, because I did it nearly as long as English, mm. I always think my French is bad because it's not as good as my English. Yes. When actually my French is fine. And we recently did, you and I, we did a, we recorded an episode of the, the Fluent Show together. Yes. Um, nous avons parlé beaucoup de français. Et le français, ça marche, ça marche assez bien pour moi. But I just think I'm bad. <laughs> and that's a big problem. I see it with my German students as well, with my general, with language students who I work with more generally. Mm. Everybody always thinks they are really bad. And it's like self-fulfilling prophecy. Yes. And so this is my mistake that I make with French. I think I'm bad. And you see, if we talk about, if we talk to the audience listening now, even she say, thinks she's bad. So don't I, think you're the only one in the world. We all believe that. So, and your French is very good. So there's absolutely no ground for thinking that. It's just all in the head. And as soon as yeah. you get beyond that, it really start changes, start mm -hmm. to change. But for French, I keep saying that over and over and over. Textbook French and spoken French is not the same language. Mm -hmm. So just stop. Students stop only focusing on textbook because no one speaks like the books. Textbook French is fantastic for the basics. Mm -hmm. And for learning grammar rules, conjugation, because you need something super stable, super clean to understand what's going on. I 100% recommend textbooks French for certain things, but don't rely on this only because no one ever, ever speaks this way. We speak faster, we eat words, we do la mm -hmm. liaison, we don't use the words from the books. There's some conjugation tenses that are only used for books. Mm -hmm. So it's going to come as a shock if people only focus on textbook French. And this is why all my courses on Common France are all about textbook French. Because mm -hmm. so many students have taken uh, French in high school or they're taking it now, which is great. But if you want to speak the way we do and understand shows and movies, you need spoken French, which is almost a different language. Yes, yeah. See, when I learned Spanish, mm -hmm. I learned... Um, the, the course was called Spanish Conversation, mm -hmm. and my, which means you are expected to put out mm -hmm. so much more. And yes, it was my fifth foreign language. Wow. <laughs> but I stopped having formal lessons in Spanish, which means I really, I stopped doing anything in Spanish mm -hmm. um, in 2000. And, 15 years ago, okay. I can still have a basic conversation in Spanish. And I think it's because I practiced it so much mm. because my course was so practical. Mm. It stuck so much more. So this is, again, about this, this idea of study. Not, it's weird, right? Even if you study for six hours, it's not enough, not for long term. Yes. Um, yes. And do you use the language? Mm -hmm. It's very mm -hmm. important. So you activate your brain. It's finding the vocabulary, finding the grammar, finding all the conjugation maybe there and putting <laughs> it all together and saying something that's wrong, but at least you said it. Yes, exactly. And that way also you get the correction. You quickly 
get a feel mm. for real living French and maybe also French where you live. Because for me, I had a whole different experience going to Canada than mm. I ever had in France. People are less formal in Canada, which I really liked. There's less vu. And, mm. you know, for me, German, I think I come with the baggage that Z is very, like, formal mm. and respectful. And in, in French, it's a little bit more relaxed mm. when you say vu. But in Canada, they just, they switched. My experience was that vu went away a lot earlier and it made me more comfortable. Mm. So it's the, it's sometimes it's the little things and then you don't know that when you're reading a book. Mm. You just can't. Absolutely. So to finish this interview, thank you so much for your time. Do you have resources that you use and you like to improve your own French? I like to, yes, a few things, a few things. There's a, there's a good book uh, from Teach Yourself which I think is called, there's a number, so many ways to improve your French. Okay. <laughs> I can't remember the number, we'll but it sort it. of picks up on things people regularly get wrong. And I, that was a good refresher for okay. me. I like to read parallel texts, mm -hmm. um, but I also like to read things like the Mademoiselle blog, mm -hmm. which is very pop culture, not so deep, but my traditional education was pretty much like Les on Le Monde. It was always like, <laughs> let's read the Le Figaro, let's read Le Monde. Um, Nicolas Sarkozy has a new girlfriend. Or, yeah. Yeah. or like, Nicolas Sarkozy has done this. This is how, like, the time when I was learning French. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I just kind of wasn't interested. Hmm. But if there's something simple, fun about lipstick or, or, or about, you know, a good movie that is on hmm. at the moment, then I'm learning what, what movies are on in French, mm. in France, and I'm learning French because I'm still using it. And believe it or not, Mademoiselle language or Le Monde language is actually both French, so it's fine. Like, people don't have to be so highbrow, and I don't have to be so highbrow. I have to teach this to myself. Um, I also like to work with podcasts. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'm traveling to France. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Yes, I... Yeah, I, I tell my students that if you're going to get resources for understanding, comprehension, or reading, get something you like. Mm -hmm. There's no need to go into stuff that's way too old for you or that's completely outdated or you don't care about. If you love gardening, read gardening books in French. Yes, so definitely. You'll, you'll have fun and you will learn vocabulary that you actually enjoy as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know... Sometimes the opportunities to practice come where you don't expect them. Mm. So if you're only open to a teacher, that can be tricky because you start to overlook things. So I, well, for example, you recently reached out to me and we started talking about language learning and you asked, you know, you said your podcast is, is good. Would I like, you know, would I like to interview you? And I thought, yes, yes, hmm, she's French why don't we do the episode a little bit in French? And for me, I get free practice out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes the opportunities come where, where nobody expects them. And that's very nice, very fun. Yes. Well, Kirstin, thank you so much for your time. It was fantastic having you. Uh, for the audience uh, watching this, You can get more about Kirstin and how to learn a language properly on fluentlanguage.co.uk. You'll find lots of links and resources uh, on communefrances.com. Below the video, we're going to link to uh, the blog post we mentioned, her website. You, go, you also have, you offer a free resource for people signing up to your newsletter, isn't it? Yes, I offer uh, access to a library of free resources. <laughs> So if you sign up to the newsletter, the first email contains the password and the page. And there is, there's actually, a, together with my friend Shannon from Eurolinguist, mm. who is uh, bilingual in French, she, uh, we have created um, a French food vocabulary list. So that might be fun. And I've got a list, or I've got a little booklet, so almost like a little book that tells you about lots of resources that help you learn languages There's also a guide to building a language habit or if you're feeling crazy, how to start learning Welsh, how to start learning Sanskrit. So it's really about the love of languages. You'll find a lot in there. Yeah, and I use that. I, I reviewed uh, what you were offering. I also bought 
your introductory class about how to structure your learning, and it was very, very interesting. It's, it's, I think it's worth for students to invest into how to learn instead of language material itself. Mm-hmm. But it's very, very much an investment in the long term because you're going to take one or two hours to review Kirsty material and then your learning is going to be so, so, so much faster. Mm-hmm. Yes, there's a, there's a course. If you want, I can, give, I can make it a, a $10 offer or something if somebody wants to try it. I've got a little course called Focus and Fluency, mm. and that might be a really fun place to start. So it's a relatively Absolutely. quick one. Uh, it will motivate you. It will help you apply what you're learning, and it will help you focus and deal with time management and productivity. Yeah, because everybody's busy, and it's not necessarily a priority to learn language in everyday life, even though it's a fantastic hobby. Excellent. Yeah, let's do it. High five. Thank, yes, absolutely. <laughs> How uh, do I say high five in French? Uh, we say the same word. Okay. Because we don't have a word for that, because that's very not French to do it. <laughs> ah. <laughs> <laughs> but we do it now. So thank you very much. Have a fantastic day. And um, I hope I will see you again in your podcast as well. That's right. That's right. That's uh, only a, only week, two weeks off now Fant- until that's published. Fant- I'm very excited. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup uh, for having me. And this was really, really fun. Allez. Génial. Salut. <laughs> Salut.